Good afternoon. Welcome to the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. I'm Nicola Long for the Executive Director. This afternoon's program features a good friend to the museum, Dr. Larry Sabato, director of the Center for Politics at the University of Virginia and author of the fabulous book, The Kennedy Half Century, The Presidency, Assassination and Lasting Legacy of John F. Kennedy. Our award-winning author and journalist, Philip Sheenan, author of A Cruel and Shocking Act, The Secret History of the Kennedy Assassination, and our moderator, Dave Davies, reporter and public radio contributor and fill-in host for Fresh Air at WHYY FM in Philadelphia. Welcome all back to Texas. This afternoon's program, What Has the Government Been Hiding? 54 Years of Secrets and the Release of the JFK Records is the museum's response to the all-anticipated curiosity calls and inquiries that we have received in the past months on the mandated release of the JFK records. We are extremely grateful for all our speakers today for flying to Dallas to address this utterly absorbing and timely topic and to help place now into a meaningful and relevant contextual framework the significance of these records that are now being made publicly accessible after more than five decades of secrecy. I'd like to recognize one of our museum founders, Linda Lynn Adams, for all her commitment and verve. <laughs> for more than 30 years ago, she worked so hard and tirelessly with some others actually in this room. And Meg Reed, I saw you come in, and she was also a founding board member. Um, but uh, this has been a very difficult uh, story to tell in this city over the years, and I'd like to thank them. And also to our current board members, Ken Mengis and Lynn Novak and uh, Agustin Halomo. Thank you very much for being here and for your leadership. And I'd also like to thank the Valiant team here at the Sixth Floor Museum because it, a lot goes into planning these events, and we're so extremely grateful. And there are also others of you in this audience who I'm not going to mention, but you know who you are, who have very deep personal connections to this complicated assassination story, and we're so grateful to all of you. I'll acknowledge some of you in this room. And um, the last like, uh, comment I'd like to make before turning over the stage to Dave Davies, as we remember the centennial of J. John F. Kennedy's birth this year, and we're approaching the anniversary assassination next year, 55 years. But don't forget that the memorial that the citizens of Dallas worked so hard to create and offered to the city in 1970, the Philip Johnson Kennedy Memorial Plaza. This is a significant memorial space, a public space that is often misunderstood, um, poorly appreciated, and it is really a powerful place for reflection, and it's an honor to the spirit of President Kennedy's life and this memorial needs a lot of attention and restoration work. If you go out and look at it, it's an actual disgrace. So um, today we are making, taking a collection. Uh, for those of you who would like to contribute it to that restoration, this is a community-wide effort that is being spearheaded by uh, the Sixth Floor Museum. And this is local government property, but this really needs to be a community-shared um, effort. So... Um, Without wasting any more time, I'd like to pass the stage over to Dave Davies. Thank you so much, and please give a huge round of applause to our speakers. Thank you, uh, Let me just begin by reminding everyone to, if you haven't thought of it, silence your cell phones or any other secret receivers or transmitters you might have. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also, I'll just note that the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a conversation for about 45 minutes, and then we're going to take questions that you will have submitted on those index cards. So please take advantage of those uh, and give us some interesting material to talk about. Um, you know, we're all here because we share something, right? And that's this interest in this fascinating crime, you know, more than a half century ago. And I just want to begin by asking the two of you, <clears throat> What got you interested in the assassination? What aspect of it really stirred your curiosity? Larry Sabato? Well, uh, I'll be brief, uh, which is unusual for a professor. <laughs> but uh, the truth is, I'm, I'm actually much more interested in the Kennedy life and presidency because I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia, a uh, Catholic family. And some of you who are Catholic and remember that time, it was quite literally an extra sacrament, uh, the eighth sacrament, to support and vote for John F. Kennedy. Eighty percent of Catholics did. 
I knew nothing about politics. I don't even think I knew Eisenhower was president. But when I heard people at my elementary school talk about John F. Kennedy, was the priests and the nuns, I said to my dad, well, I want to do something. And so he, he uh, took me out. We went to the Democratic headquarters, and we got a bunch of Kennedy for President literature, and I went door to door in my neighborhood. And I was seven years old. You would think that would be cute. Uh, for most people, it was. But my most vivid memory is of a, a lady, I didn't know it was several streets over, who, uh, who simply said to me, we don't support papists, and slammed the door. And it helps to toughen you up at seven. Uh, <laughs> it, it was good. But I saw President Kennedy, saw candidate Kennedy, and it's the only time I ever saw uh, President or candidate Kennedy, four days before the election, four and a half days, when he happened to come to Norfolk, they believed mistakenly that he was going to carry Virginia. And I followed along with my classmates and teachers that administration almost day by day. It was very important to us. And that was how I got interested in the assassination, because it was devastating. I, I still remember having nightmare after nightmare, and I'm sure that was true for most, most children, maybe adults at the time. Philip Sheedon, you covered a lot of stuff over the years. What got you into the assassination? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not quite old enough to remember the assassination, but, uh, you know, I was certainly raised with an image of this golden legacy of John F. Kennedy. Um, I didn't get much involved in questions about the assassination over my lifetime. Uh, what happened is I was minding my own business at my desk in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, and the phone rang, and it was quite a prominent American lawyer, this is 2008, who said, um, I had just published a book about the 9-11 Commission, and he said, uh, I see you've got some nice reviews, wouldn't you like to do a similar book about the Kennedy assassination and about the Warren Commission? And that is how I got involved in this. And I went into this project thinking that it was, I, I, I was able to explain the 9-11 conspiracy. Surely it will be easy to explain the Kennedy assassination, uh, which turned out to be an enormous mistake. And I got lost in the subject for several years. But at the end of this, I produced a book about that began as a history of the Warren Commission. And I must admit, over the course of my work on that book, I have been fascinated to discover that there's much more to that story than I ever knew and that I think most of the American public knows. Um, I wonder how many of us in this room have believed at some point in a conspiracy theory about the assassination, broadly defined. I mean, I'll raise my hand to that, right? Okay, all right. Um, Larry, you write, I mean, uh, excuse me, Philip, that there was a real conspiracy, and we can see it, and it was the conspiracy to cover up what happened when the Warren Commission the commission appointed by President Johnson after the assassination set about doing its work, got some terrific investigators, many of whom you interview. Um, how far did the FBI and CIA go in keeping evidence from the Warren Commission? Well, that was my discovery. Um, others had discovered it before, but I was struck by how much basic evidence had been hidden from the Warren Commission in 1964, how many important witnesses had never been interviewed. And it's very clear in the hours after the assassination that both the CIA and the FBI set out to destroy evidence of what they had known about this man, Lee Harvey Oswald, before the assassination. And the story seems to be in many ways that there was a conspiracy, there was a cover-up, and they wanted to cover up just how much more they had known about this man, Oswald, and the threat he posed to President Kennedy. Larry, you write in your book about all the witnesses at Dealey Plaza who were never even contacted or interviewed by the Warren Commission. What, what's been the impact of an investigation that didn't, didn't look at what it should have? Well, we've had 54 years of speculation and conspiracy, and you can really date the decline of public confidence in government from November 22, 1963. Before, before that, at least for the post-World War II period, I think people were optimistic uh, they knew the United States uh, had the premier position in the world and all the rest of it. But the process began the deterioration in Americans' trust in their own government. They thought their government was lying to them. And I agree with what Philip has just said. I, I do want to say this for the Warren Commission. I know you were, you were kind to them in your book, or you were understanding about what, what they had been through. The staff deserves credit for doing what they could do with the information and the resources they were given. President Johnson wanted it done quickly for his own reasons. Uh, he was running for re-election in November. He wanted it done well before that. And most importantly, he and Jay Hoover and plenty of others 
wanted to make sure that Americans didn't think that Castro or Khrushchev, that is uh, two uh, communist countries, were involved in any way, shape, or form because it could lead to nuclear war. Well, I don't think any of us in here would have wanted that. I lived a mile from the largest naval base in the world, Norfolk, Virginia, and I, I, would, be, I would be here. I would be obliterated, despite duck and cover. It wouldn't have worked. Um, so, you know, I, my personal opinion is that the CIA and the FBI and probably others in the administration simply did not want the embarrassment, did not want to have to explain how they let this very strange individual, one of, I believe, nine people to defect, Americans to defect to the Soviet Union. You had to be nuts to defect to the Soviet Union. It was not a worker's paradise. No matter what they said, it was a horrible, horrible place. Uh, and, and he did that and then came back and did a lot of other things they found strange, like the Mexico City trip that we still don't fully understand. And yet they let him slip through their fingers. They knew they had let him slip through their fingers, and they didn't want to face the, the questions that would come from the public. What, this, is, this was a preventable assassination. So in the effort to reassure the American public there was no conspiracy, they spawned conspiracy theories for decades. And it's also fascinating that so many of the principles President Johnson, Robert Kennedy, believed that uh, he had been killed by a conspiracy. Let's, let's turn to the new documents. Philip, why are we now this year seeing thousands of documents? Why were they classified in the first place? Why are they being released now? Well, we're seeing them because of Oliver Stone and his movie in 1991, JFK, which really spun a million conspiracy theories about the assassination and really shaped, shaped the thinking of a new generation about the assassination. And because of the furor created by that film, Congress passed a law the following year that forced the release of all documents in the government's files related to the assassination and put a 25-year deadline on release of those files. And that 25-year deadline is what passed last month. Unfortunately, the government didn't release the, uh, didn't meet the deadline to release all those documents. And maybe or maybe not, we'll see them before, uh, before April of next year. So thousands have been released. President Trump said he was going to withhold some, Larry, right, at the request of the CIA and the FBI. I believe he said that, that they could do irreversible harm to our national security. Yeah, if they did irreversible. If they, okay. I, I think Phil's being, being awfully tough here. They only had 25 years. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's, that's like that in governmental terms. But they had no intention of releasing them. And the FBI and the CIA leadership were hoping that the president in office at the time when that date approached, October 26, uh, 2017, would be sympathetic to their view that it would be unnecessary for the American public to see it and would cause irreparable harm to them and their credibility. Again, it's 54 years ago. Mm -hmm. Who's going to hold the current leadership of the CIA and the FBI, which uses other methods and people and wasn't there at the time, who's going to hold them responsible for what happened in the late 50s and early 60s leading up to the assassination. So it's unfortunate. Uh, President Trump, to his credit, and you know, I wouldn't call myself his greatest advocate, but to his credit, he, uh, he has pushed reasonably hard for the documents to be released. Now, the true test will come in April, uh, but I, I'm convinced that if they had had a more sympathetic president, that is the FBI and the CIA, we wouldn't be seeing most of what we're seeing now, including 10,000 documents, most of them old, but 144 new ones from the FBI just yesterday. We've been going through those on this trip. Uh, so we've got something to work with now, not that there's necessarily going to be spectacular revelations. Right. So, so do either of you see any legitimate reason for withholding this stuff now? No, I don't. No. Okay. Uh, other than if there is somebody, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, We've covered maybe 20% of it. We've had a lot of people working on it, including a lot of my students. They love this. And they've actually gotten into history on account of it. They've gotten to love history on account of it. But it's only been uh, a little while. We've got a long way to go. Maybe there's something important in there. But, um, I think we both believe there may be the names of people who were informants or agents of the CIA and the FBI in 1964 who might still be alive, might be living overseas, and might be in danger if their identities were exposed. But that has to be a very small number of people, and they can be protected if need be. So still assets that might be in danger. In, 
in theory. Can, um, can I just mention yeah. one, just to give an example of the worthlessness of these redactions? There's one uh, memo from, I believe, the NSA to uh, the government of an unnamed country, but it's clearly in Central or South America. It was served by Pan American Airlines. <laughs> And the day after the assassination, someone there writes to uh, somebody high up in that government and says, we don't believe that your delegation to, the, to President Kennedy's funeral is senior enough. And we believe that you should, should add people at a more senior level, more appropriate to the funeral, uh, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But they redact the name of the country. Now, the leaders of that country, I'm sure, are long dead. And, that's a, that's a useful footnote in history. Maybe it's more than a footnote in that country, but why can't we know that? We're adults. I think we can handle this, don't you? Really. And the danger is when something's not released, the speculation about what might have been there is, can be more harmful. You know, uh, these documents are available to everyone on the National Archives website, and when you look at them, um, what you will see is that there will be a memo from the you know, San Diego office of the FBI to the, to the director of the, of the FBI. And a lot of it's full of acronyms and abbreviations and notations which were, would be unscrutable to, is it unscrutable or inscrutable? Inscrutable. Thank yeah. you. Inscrutable to, to the uninformed. What, ha, what, do you, what do you two do when you look at these? And... <laughs> Or are, is this a case where we're going to, the country's going to crowdsource them and maybe find things that... that well, it's going to take years. That's what I... I'll, I you had this very same thing happen to you on the day the first batch came out. Leading up to that, a couple weeks' worth of press calls, not you, you were very thoughtful, <laughs> but press, press people saying, look, um, we're going to schedule a story for this on the afternoon <laughs> of the release. Can, you, can we call you that afternoon? You can give us a rundown of what's in there. No, there are hundreds of thousands of pages. You know, there, there's no way in the world to do it. But uh, we put That's them in why we pump. preemptively wrote a newspaper yes. article saying that it was going to be a mess when it happened. And it was. It was. It was a mess. So we put them in different categories. Some of them um, you can interpret immediately, and they're interesting. And, and there's a nugget that everybody can seize on. And as you mentioned, in other cases, so many acronyms, and it's just a vacuum cleaner of gossip and and uh, intercepts, and nobody can figure out what it is, or it's going to take years to figure out what it means. So, have you seen anything that sheds new light on important questions? Either of you. Well, we should be clear that there was a, there were a batch of about 3,000 super secret documents that we'd not seen a word of until this most recent release, and most of those documents are still secret today. We still don't have them. The documents we've gotten are mostly documents that had been released in the past in part. And we've got fuller versions of them, but often we don't have complete versions of That's them. That's right. I, I, in the, in the batch, batches since August, uh, October, I haven't seen much that's all that new or different. Uh, there, was some, there were some interesting releases over the summer. They did put out an initial batch in July, and there were a couple of documents in there that really were useful, but in the most recent batch, no. Um, Philip, you've, in, in some of the documents that came out earlier this year, mm -hmm. and you've you plumbed material on a subject that you have written about in your book, and that is Oswald's trip to Mexico City about six weeks before the assassination mm -hmm. when he visited the Soviet and Cuban, Cuban embassies. Give us a sense of what, the, what, what are the interesting questions raised by that trip, and what have we learned? Well, I, this whole business about Mexico City is the great untold story, I think, of the Kennedy assassination saga. And I don't think most Americans know anything about it, which is that Lee Harvey Oswald, just six weeks before the assassination, takes a trip to Mexico City. Uh, now, remember, Oswald's 24 years old, former Marine, knows how to handle a weapon, and a declared Marxist who once tried to def defect to the Soviet Union. And we know from previously declassified files that Oswald, while he's in Mexico, is meeting with Cuban spies and Russian spies and Mexicans who are very supportive of Castro's revolution. Um, there's reason to believe that Oswald talks about killing Kennedy when he's in Mexico City. Um, and it's very clear from the record that the FBI and the CIA were determined not to get to the bottom of what happened in Mexico City. And a lot of the documents that are still secret involve this Mexico City trip and what the CIA knew about Oswald in Mexico City. And we also know that the CIA was following Oswald in Mexico City. Anyway, one of the documents that we got over the summer was a document that revealed that 
in the years after the assassination, the CIA weighed a theory in-house that suggested a motive for Oswald to have killed Kennedy, which is something the Warren Commission ducked. They really didn't answer the question of Oswald's motives. But it seems that the, th the CIA believed that Oswald may have read a particular newspaper article just a few weeks before the assassination that revealed that Fidel Castro was under threat of assassination by the Kennedy administration, that Oswald became enraged on Castro's behalf and then set out to kill Kennedy, to kill Kennedy before Kennedy could kill Castro. And that makes a lot of sense, and it's interesting to see that the CIA, month, uh, years after the assassination, is weighing whether or not there really was a different story about the, the killing of the president. Right, and we should note that although it's now established fact that the United States had engineered several plots to kill Castro, this was not known at the time of the assassina assassination and was kept from the Warren Commission, so they couldn't, they had no reason to explore that as a potential motive. Let's just go take one further step into the Mexico trip. There's a woman named Sylvia Duran, a Mexican national who worked for the Cuban embassy. She's an interesting figure in this. Tell us about her. She's fascinating, and she's still alive, and I hope somebody's able to really get her to tell the full story. But uh, you, you, I, you did my best. I did my best. She's pretty old. I don't know. <laughs> she's pretty spry. I think she has, she has some stories to tell. She, she is the person who deals face-to-face -face with Oswald at the Cuban embassy in Mexico City. Oswald is trying to get a visa that will allow him to defect to Cuba, much as he once tried to defect to the Soviet Union. Uh, there's reason to believe there was a brief romance between Sylvia Duran and Oswald while he's there. Um, she, and we believe that a lot of the records that are still secret might involve surveillance of Sylvia Odio and Oswald at the time of Sylvia Oswald's, Duran. S Sylvia, I'm sorry, Sylvia Duran uh, at the time of Oswald's visit down there. There's another Sylvia Odio, and that's another fascinating story. But so, so, so Sylvia Duran says that she was at a party where Oswald was there. No, she doesn't say that. Others say that she was at a party with Oswald where he was heard saying that he wanted to... So apparently during this Mexico City trip, Sylvia Duran, or the story is, Sylvia Duran invites Lee Harvey Oswald and two beatnik American friends who have never been identified to come to a, a family party. And at this party, there are Cuban diplomats and there are Mexicans who are socialists and supporters of Castro's revolution. And people at this, talk, at this party are talking openly about their hope that somebody would kill President Kennedy. You know, this is only a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is the very height of the Cold War, and there was really reason in that at that time for, for people maybe to have wanted to see President Kennedy dead. Right. So whatever happened, the, the CIA and the FBI didn't talk much about it. Larry, your, your thoughts on Mexico City or other aspects of this that you think we really need to know more about? Well, that's certainly one, and he was there for six days, and we only know about a few hours. Now, and apparently he, photographed and yes and phone conversations recorded at least at the embassies right. um, who knows and, and that was why we needed the Warren Commission to do that then uh, and they did know about the Mexico City trip I guess they sent an investigator down briefly uh, didn't return with much and that was the end of that the trail was hot then we actually would have gotten some useful information one way or the other I don't know how honest people would have been but we would have gotten something, and we would have known some names to follow up on in, in future years. Um, one thing, though, and, and again, I'm not arguing it one way or the other because I want to be open to what we do discover in the rest of the documents, 80% of them, that we haven't been through. But uh, in these documents, I've learned a few things I didn't know before about Oswald. I had never realized that he had threatened the life of President Eisenhower. It was not reported to the FBI at the time. This was in 1957. He told a friend who was in the military that he wanted to kill Eisenhower. And the real question was why Eisenhower was picked by Oswald. The friend asked him, and he supposedly said uh, that um, he was the, the, uh, the lead uh, capitalist who was persecuting poor people in the United States. Uh, sadly, that individual didn't report this until after the Kennedy assassination. But uh, this guy had murder on his mind. I mean, he was a violent person. We know he was a spousal abuser. In fact, just the other week, we didn't have a chance to talk about this, I got a call from a former Georgia congressman who said, I really need to talk to you. So I called him. He's a reliable person. And he told me about a very good friend of his who happened to live in Dallas at that time, knew somebody who knew the, uh, the Oswalds, and 
was very worried because Marina was getting ready to move back in, to, uh, in with Lee, and they knew for a fact that he had beaten her up and so on. Mm -hmm. So this individual was very big and burly, offered to help them move back into the apartment. Marina was sent in while he held Lee back, and he said to Lee, I know all about you, and I know that you've been abusing her. If you lay a hand on her again, I'm going to come over and beat the blank out of you. And at that point, reportedly, Oswald said, oh, no, sir, I won't do anything like that. I'll never do it again. And, but I'm saying there, there's so much there we could have discovered. We knew he was a spousal abuser. But you never know what you're going to find when you pull up a rock here or there. Right. And... And we also know, too, I was amazed, I'm always amazed that this happens just a few blocks from where we are at this very moment, but Oswald, in April of 1963, tried to kill General Edwin Walker. I'm, I'm not sure what neighborhood of Dallas that was, but not very far from here. How many you people know, know that story, I mean, the attempted assassination? But we, we have really informed this crowd. This is a knowledgeable yeah. bunch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. Most Americans don't know this. He was a retired general and a, and a right-wing activist, mm -hmm. and there was an attempt on his life from a, a sharpshooter at some distance away, right? Right. It fires into his house, uh, b barely misses him, um, and apparently... Same rifle. Same rifle. And Oswald goes home that night and, and admits it to Marina. Marina acknowledged she was aware of that assassination attempt just several months before the Kennedy assassination. Oh, one other fact that's relevant to his violent past, and I don't think people know this either, um, he claimed to Marina months before the Kennedy assassination that he was going out to kill former Vice President Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. Now, Marina didn't know that Nixon wasn't actually coming to Dallas at that time. He was going someplace else uh, in Texas. And he was doing it to psychologically abuse her. But it just shows, again, the sorts of thoughts that were on Oswald's mind. Now, that's not to say that no one else was involved or all the rest of it. I'm not getting into those arguments today. But there's a lot there. When you, when you do connect the dots, you start to see a picture of an individual who could really have done this. Yeah, you know, there's there's so much eeriness in all of this, and one of one of these fascinating details, Sylvia Duran, the woman in Mexico City, her birthday, November 22nd. How about that? Um, have any of these documents that have been revealed um, contributed anything to the notion that there was a second gunman on Dealey Plaza or a mafia conspiracy to, to, to kill the president? Well, they certainly asked those questions at the CIA. You mentioned that document where they were reassessing mm -hmm. within the CIA how that earlier generation had, uh, had interpreted the events of November 22nd. And they asked a lot of good questions, uh, and I think they weren't completely sure. Uh, to the extent that we know, uh, these other groups were not directly involved. Uh, it's possible we don't know some things. In fact, it's very probable we don't know some things. But... Uh, there are so many people who had so many motives to kill any president, much less this particular president. Any president has loads of enemies, and given the right set of circumstances, maybe they would try to, try to kill the president. But you need proof in the end. You have to find the proof. Uh, theoretically, it could have been the mafia, it could have been the anti-Castro Cubans, it could have been Castro, it could have been the Russians, it could have been, you know, I don't believe the Lyndon Johnson thing at all, but you know there are some people who insist it was... Lyndon Johnson. There are so many motives, groups, and individuals who could have been suspected and are suspected of this. But in the end, you know, maybe we need Columbo back. You know, we need, we need somebody to, to find the proof. What was the phrase? A mystery wrapped in a uh, riddle surrounded by an enigma, enigma which yes. is actually was not original to this thing. Um, how many people know the work of David Lifton, the book Best Evidence? This is, this is something I read years ago. I mean, it's like an 800-page tome in which he gradually leads you through this evidence and convinces you that the president's body, as it was taken to Bethesda uh, Naval Base for the autopsy, was actually stolen, removed, and the wounds on the president's body altered to conform to the single bullet theory, which at that point nobody knew about, uh, and then returned to the autopsy table for, for Dr. Humes and others. Now, this... This is, I cite this only as an example of just what a sprawling, complicated, confusing thing this whole thing is, and you can really get lost in it. I'm, I'm wondering how the two of you, um, how do you evaluate new information? How do you know what's credible? Look, <laughs> no, no, 
Thanks a lot. Yeah. Look, at, at some point, I, I've been thinking about it since I was a kid, and I spent five years researching uh, the Kennedy half century. A lot of that was on President Kennedy's uh, life and administration, not just death. But after you spend that much time, and you spent years on it too, naturally you form an opinion. It may be wrong. You're, you're, you, know, you may come down on the wrong side. You may find information a few years later that makes you reconsider it. But my framework for evaluating, and I know it's going to alienate some people in the room, I have come to believe, having believed in conspiracies for years before I really took enough time to read everything, um, I, I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. Now, when you say he acted alone, by that I mean he's the one who shot the, uh, the bullets from this window over here and killed President Kennedy and wounded uh, Governor Connolly. I don't have an opinion about whether others encouraged him to do it because I don't know. I don't have information about whether, although I suspect he did down in Mexico City, tell other people in advance of what his intentions were and then they didn't report it. Of course, why would anybody in the Russian or Cuban embassy report that you know, to the American FBI? The Cubans and the Soviets knew the Americans were trying to, to kill Castro and had tried repeatedly to do so. And there are some great documents, by the way, in these releases that have nothing to do with President Kennedy, but are about Operation Mongoose, uh, things we've never heard before, like poisoning all the crops in Cuba to starve the Cuban people to cause them to revolt and overthrow Castro and to send uh, parts in, airplane parts that have been monkeyed with so that they will cause planes to crash that would somehow cause people to rise up against Castro, so there's a lot in there. But anyway, that's my framework. And every new piece of information I get, I suppose I evaluate it in terms of that framework. One, one of the great frustrations in this story, uh, going into it as a reporter or as an historian, is that you know the conspiracy theories about this, a lot of them are logical. It would make sense for the mafia to want to see Kennedy dead. It would make sense for Fidel or the Soviets or uh, the Teamsters Union or the Ku Klux Klan to want to see Kennedy dead. So you've got to weigh all those conspiracy theories because they make sense in, at, the, at some level. But you have to ask, where is their evidence? There just isn't credible evidence to support any of those conspiracy theories. The one conspiracy theory I guess I might subscribe to is the one involving the idea that there are people who knew what Oswald was talking about doing and may have encouraged him to do that, and that leads you to Mexico City, which, as I say, all for my, to my mind, all roads lead to Mexico City if you want to understand unsolved mysteries about the Kennedy assassination. It's conceivable they could have offered support or an offer for asylum afterwards or transit out. Was there any evidence that he might have been headed to Mexico after the asylum? He was absolutely headed. He was absolutely heading for the border. Uh, and, that, and in fact, this idea that something happened in Mexico City was an idea pursued within the Warren Commission. There was one staff member who became convinced on the, I won't, we'll, through all the details of it, but he finds a, a bus transfer stub from the Dallas bus company, and he determines that Oswald is on his way to Laredo, and is Laredo on the border? Yes. Okay. So he's on his way to Laredo because somebody is waiting there to help him escape, and this is an arrangement that would have been made in Mexico City six weeks before. Now, none of that theory was put into the Warren Commission report because Chief Justice Warren and the other commissioners didn't want to encourage conspiracy theories. And it's interesting that the Warren Commission was aware of Sylvia Duran. And um, will you tell the story of why she was not interviewed? So Sylvia Duran, this woman who may or may not have had an affair with Oswald in Mexico City, who definitely dealt with him face to face, who may have taken him to this party where people were talking about killing Kennedy. On the staff of the Warren Commission, they thought she might be the most important witness they had available to them because she, she knew Oswald, she knew his mindset at the time, she was a fellow socialist, she might have, he might have shared things with her. And after much dispute in Mexico City, she finally agrees to come to Washington to be interviewed by the Warren Commission staff, and the staff is thrilled about this prospect. Uh, but in what I think is probably the most baffling decision made by Earl Warren during the course of the investigation, he refuses to allow her to come. He says, his words are, according to the staff, she's a communist and we don't talk to communists, we don't believe communists. So as a result, this vital witness was never interviewed, but she is still alive to this day in Mexico City and I always believe she has secrets to share. Yeah, Earl Warren, boy. It's hard to believe that's really the reason, but 
It well, probably was. Remember yeah, when, when Johnson recruited him, he didn't want to take this assignment at all. Earl Warren. Earl Warren didn't. And Johnson, of course, you couldn't resist Lyndon Johnson when he gave you the Johnson treatment. But he put it in terms of patriotism. And he said, you would fight for our country were I to draft you and put you in the military. And, and he said, well, it's oh, more dramatic than that. He actually says to Earl Warren, if you don't take this assignment, we're going to have World War III, yes. and it's going to be your responsibility. Exactly. It's, and apparently this leaves Earl Warren in tears, um, this, this prospect, and then he finally gives in and accepts the job. The point I, I agree with that. The point I'm making here is that Earl Warren went on this commission as a point of patriotism. Mm, absolutely. And the way Johnson presented it to him was more not finding out the truth necessarily about the assassination, but making sure the American public didn't turn on uh, Cuba and Russia and force us into a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And part of that means that as you're conducting your study, while you, know, you want to find out the truth if you can, you're going to shade it if you have to to make sure that certain things don't come out that might spark a public reaction that would result in nuclear war. So to reassure the American public, we deceive them, and in the end, it doesn't work. Yeah, um, well, that's how it used to work. Maybe well, it's, it's interesting, though. Let's say the Warren Commission Hypothetically, they did pursue this evidence that maybe there was a Cuban tie to the assassination. Maybe that would have spiraled into something much more serious on the international stage. Maybe Johnson would have been forced to react to invade Cuba. You know, the world might be different. You can see where the hope was that there was no foreign tie, uh, and let's get let Johnson get on with his presidency. Yeah, bigger bigger pieces on the chessboard. Um, you, you know, we're talking about. U.S. government documents that can be released, and they're limited to what the U.S. government kind of did, knew, and observed. Um, I'm wondering what other records you think might be revealing to us. I don't know that there's an archive of the New Orleans mob, but... Um, well, there are think, intercepts of right. them talking. Things in Havana, for example. I mean, yeah. has the Cuban government shared everything, or the Soviets, or I don't know. Are there, are there other areas that might yet yield uh, fruitful avenues of evidence? Well, I know that over the years, investigators have been very eager to, there, there are enormous KGB files on Lee Harvey Oswald from his time living in the, in the Soviet Union. And apparently, he lives in the city of Minsk, and he's having dealings there with Cubans and other people who may later figure in this drama. And those KGB files have been sitting there all these years, and uh, the United States has never been given access to them. Well, Boris Yeltsin gave Bill Clinton, some of them, some of them in the 1990s. Right. And this is amazing. I don't think anybody anticipated that. They exonerated the Soviet Union. <laughs> Those particular pages did. <laughs> so again, it's, it's been so many years now. How in the world can we be expected to piece it all together now? Which is why so many people are critical, maybe too much so, of the Warren Commission. Uh, and really the commissioners, not the staffers. They only knew what they knew for the most part. No, the staffers of the Warren Commission and these, these hotshot young lawyers, most in their 20s or 30s at the time, I'll tell you, having talked to all, virtually all of the surviving ones, they really worked their heart out, and they were eager to find the truth, even if the truth was an ugly conspiracy. Right. And Arlen Specter, um, Pennsylvania senator, who fashioned the single bullet theory and was ridiculed his whole life for it. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, we had the Warren Commission, we never had a trial of Oswald because of Jack Ruby's uh, assassination of him. Um, and there have been other attempts, official attempts, to come at the truth. And one of them was the House, House Select Committee on Assassinations in the 1970s. And what's interesting about that is, you know, some of this stuff is fuzzy. What do people remember? What did they hear about what somebody else remembered? And that's always subject to tests of credibility. But then there are all these technical issues, right, ballistics evidence. And what that select committee did was looked at this dicta belt, this Dallas police recording of a, of a transmission of a police motorcycle that had been left in the open position when the assassination occurred. And its acoustical analysts concluded that there was four shots, not three, in Dealey Plaza, probably another gunman on the grassy knoll. And Larry, in your book, this is, a, this is something of a scoop. It's a bit technical, but what did you discover about it? Well, uh, the good news is that anybody who's interested in this, we basically disproved beyond any shadow of a doubt the conclusion of the House investigation in the mid-'70s. Remember, there are two government reports on the assassination. The Warren Commission says there was no conspiracy, and this second investigation uh, by the House of Representatives Special Committee 
indicates there was a conspiracy, but they didn't identify the conspirators. Well, we, we didn't eliminate the possibility of conspiracy, but we disproved uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt using the most advanced sound techniques. We hired a firm called Sonalist at great cost that eliminated all profits from this book, I might add. Uh, and, uh, Ouch. Yeah, Ouch. It, it hurt, but I was proud that we were able to do it. Ken Stroop here managed that to my associate director. He's around here someplace. Uh, I do want to say this, though. Uh, I think it's an interesting section of the book. Now, you should all buy it. It makes a wonderful holiday <laughs> gift. And there are signed copies down in the bookstore, so you won't want to leave until you had... And, and so Phil's book is down there, too, Cruel and Shocking Act. If you have some extra money, you can buy his. <laughs> um, what's fascinating is that you discover it's not just a technical analysis of the videotape. <coughs> you figure out that it was actually a different police officer yeah. whose mic was open. Is that the trademark? H.B. McLean, who was the officer who was thought to have had his mic open, always said he was never there. And he was you right. You discover there's this other officer, Willie Price, who's farther down the road. and it's You're telling them the end of the movie. <laughs> they won't buy the book. Well... I was going to say this anyway, but I'll say it right now. I mean, I've read a fair amount about the Kennedy assassination, and I've read both these guys' books, and they're both great reads, and there's just, I found stuff that was new to me, and it's really interesting, and it was a pleasure. So I don't get any, co any commissions from this, but I... You sure about that? I recommend well, we appreciate it. <laughs> if you could uh, spend an afternoon with anybody associated with this thing, someone who's now deceased, and they had to tell you the truth for an afternoon, who would you want to talk to? Would you want to know? So they have deceased? to tell us the truth? Somebody deceased. They have to tell you the truth. Somebody oh. deceased. Living or dead? Living or dead. Oh, I'd pick Lyndon Johnson. That's a good And I'd, I'd ask him choice. about a lot more than the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> <laughs> That's the next book, right? Okay. <laughs> right. Um, what, what, what would you want to ask Lyndon Johnson? Um, I, well, I want to. He clearly believed in a conspiracy. And after all, he was president for five and a half years. He had access to everything he wanted to have access to. He told Walter Cronkite in a nationally aired uh, interview after he had left the presidency that it was Castro and that he said the Kennedys were running a murder incorporated in the, in the Caribbean and that, uh, that uh, essentially Kennedy was trying to kill Castro. Castro got to him first, I think, are the words that he This was used. blowback for the, Kennedy, uh, the Kennedys' efforts to kill Castro. To, get, to kill Castro, exactly. But I would want to know precisely what he had discussed with various members of the Warren Commission, not just Earl Warren. He had his good friend Richard Russell, senator from Georgia, mm -hmm. who absolutely refused at first to be on the commission because uh, Earl, he, he was a conservative southerner opposed to all civil rights legislation, and he did not want to be on a commission with Earl Warren, didn't want to have his photo taken with Earl Warren. And Johnson basically said, oh, I'm sorry, I've already announced it, which was a lie. He hadn't announced it. But he left Russell with no choice but to get on. But along the way, I know he had conversations with Russell and others. He wanted to be kept informed. He was worried that this would blow up during the 64 campaign, and that was his focus in 1964. But that's just a tiny bit of it. Can I just work in one quick anecdote? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned these documents. If you're interested in these things being flashed up here, this is uh, from our research uh, with all the new documents, including ones released yesterday. Uh, we have uh, dozens of them, and I've sent them out on Twitter. Anything we think is significant and interesting, we sent out on Twitter. My Twitter feed is at Larry Sabato, L-A-R-Y-S-A-B-A-T-O. But one of them, uh, we're learning things, uh, again, that don't have a lot to do with the assassination, but this one in particular grabbed me because it was, uh, it was from uh, the CIA or NSA on uh, the French, it was NSA, uh, about the French government, De Gaulle and others, their reaction to the assassination. And essentially this piece said that the French government believed that Lyndon Johnson w uh, was a cipher. He amounted to nothing. He won't get a full term. Uh, this is terrible for America and the Western Alliance and, and the US has to find real leadership soon. Totally false. Tuesday, I have to run into Lady uh, to uh, Linda Bird Johnson Robb, daughter of, of Linda Johnson. I told her about this piece because I thought she would enjoy it. She didn't enjoy it. She got very angry about the French. And then she said, I shouldn't tell you this, but I was there when my daddy called Dean, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State. And uh, he called him over and he says, Dean, uh, de Gaulle has threatened to leave NATO. 
De Gaulle has, has said that we have to withdraw U.S. troops from France, and I simply want you in quiet terms to communicate one thing to him, and that is that if he lifts a finger to do either of these things, I'm going to send a bunch of American troops over there without permission to dig up every single American who was killed in World War I and mm. World War II buried in France to defend France. Mm. Last we heard of it from wow. de Gaulle. Yeah. De Gaulle didn't follow through on most of that. Mm. Isn't that interesting? And wow. I don't think people know this. And this is what you find when you start piecing together little nuggets of history. Oh, I th these documents, apart from the Kennedy assassination, they're a really fantastic they're snapshot incredible. of the Cold War in that time. In and J. Edgar Hoover and his obsession oh, with Martin Luther Edgar King. Yeah. And everything was a communist. The communists were behind everything. They were a tiny, tiny little group in America. They amounted to nothing except in Hoover's mind. Uh, do we have the index cards for, uh, for some audience questions? Why don't you bring them on up? And, and I want to give Phil Sheenan... If, um, Okay, uh, Philip. Uh, so when, when you when you have questions for me, just hand them up. And Philip, do you want to answer my question about who your dream interview would be? Person living would be Sylvia Duran. So there is this woman you who stopped her in front of her apartment. I, her I talked to her. I talked to her. And she she adamantly denied she'd had an affair with Oswald. She adamantly denied he'd been to this party where people were talking about killing Kennedy. But I kind of believe she wasn't telling me okay. the truth. And okay, I, but you if you had an afternoon when she had to tell you the truth. Okay. Right. I'm the only person. following your rules here. Okay, very good. A uh, person who is no longer with us would be uh, Ambassador Thomas Mann, a very proud Texan, I believe a graduate of the University of Texas. Uh, he was the ambassador in Mexico at the time of the assassination. He is absolutely convinced from the first minute he hears about the assassination that this involves Oswald's trip to Mexico City, that he made connections in Mexico with people who are going to help him escape. They may have put him up to the assassination. He is convinced absolutely in his mind this is true. And he very quickly receives a call from Washington being told to shut down any investigation in Mexico City that might point to foreign involvement in the assassination. He's told that there's not to be an investigation down there. And how do we know he got this call? Well, that's what he tells us. He's, he said it to, to congressional investigators later. Um, and it's very clear from the record we do have that he was desperate, desperate is the right word, uh, to find evidence in Mexico City that might support this idea that there was a, a, a Cuban involvement, not Castro personally, but Cubans in Mexico City. Uh, but he discovers that the CIA representative in the embassy and the FBI representative in the embassy have also been told not to investigate this. There's something the agencies were desperate to hide in Mexico. Um, he comes back to Washington and becomes the senior advisor to President Johnson about Latin American issues, and I believe he is the guy who is feeding information to LBJ to suggest there's a Castro connection, which is why LBJ dies with the idea that there was a conspiracy that was never exposed. You know, we've been talking about how the government withheld documents and in some cases destroyed evidence. Are there cases where they also sought to silence or intimidate people who had evidence or things to say that they didn't want to become public? I'm trying to think of the best example of that. Um, you know, uh, after, immediately after the assassination, and go back to my favorite witness, um, the CIA tells the Mexican government to round up Sylvia Duran and her husband and her family to interrogate them um, and to physically intimidate them. And I suspect it's they wanted to physically intimidate her not to tell the full truth about what she knew. Uh, Just to Barry, mention, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this was obviously a very different time, and it was before the Supreme Court decisions on... Uh, individual rights when one is arrested and that kind of thing. And I remember when I was researching my book, I came down here and had an interview with Bill Alexander, who was mm -hmm. the assistant uh, prosecutor in this area. And, and he, he said something that I'll never forget. He said, the, I asked him what his greatest regret was, and I thought he'd say, well, we shouldn't have transferred Oswald, you know, and that morning we shouldn't have let the public in. But instead he said, I just regret that I did not have two or three days alone with Lee Harvey Oswald to interrogate him. And he said, believe me, we would have gotten the truth out of him. <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant, and everyone of a certain age here knows exactly what he meant. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's true, they, they did that. They had, there was one, the fellow who drove 
Oswald to the school book depository. We've had him several times in Charlottesville. The students love talking to him. He wasn't involved at all. He knew Oswald as a co-worker and happened to live in the same neighborhood and drove him uh, back and forth at the end of the week when he went to see his, his uh, wife. But in any event, he, uh, he was arrested uh, because it was reported, of course, that he had driven Lee Harvey Oswald to the school book depository that morning. And the police roughed him up like you wouldn't believe. I mean, really roughed him up and put a confession in front of him. I am involved in the, in the conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. And uh, they finally realized he wasn't going to sign it because he didn't really know anything. But they took him back home, and, and he's told us a number of times he shook all night. Who wouldn't? you know, to be suspected of that horrible crime. So completely different. He never had a lawyer, completely different time. Uh, but, you know, we, you, we learn things from it, and uh, we've progressed. All right, so let's go to a couple of audience questions here. Um, this is new to me. Uh, what circumstances uh, surround the disappearance of President Kennedy's brain? Mm. <laughs> I, I know that story. Yeah. Um, go ahead. President Kennedy's brain. Um, it was removed during the autopsy at Parkland Hospital. It's just an example of just these crazy mysteries about yeah, this Bethesda. murder. Bethesda, Bethesda, I'm sorry. Bethesda. The, the brain is removed as part of the autopsy. It is then delivered to the White House a couple of days later by one of the pathologists from Bethesda. Um, it is then given to President Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, uh, who takes it to her office in, she has an office at the National Archives at that point, and past that point we have no idea where his brain went. We have a suspicion that it was eventually given to Robert Kennedy and then interred with the president's body at Arlington, but we don't have absolute confirmation of that. I mean, there's a reason to, there is certainly no official version of whatever happened to the president's brain. You know, Robert Kennedy is an interesting figure in all of this. I mean, he's told many people he believed there was a conspiracy. Uh, it's not what he told the Warren Commission, is it? He's a politician, you know, and he really was. Again, this shocks everybody, but they often say one thing in private, another thing in public. So write that down so you'll always remember Honest? that. Yeah. <laughs> but you got to admit, it is odd to be not telling the truth about your brother's murder, though. You know, that does put a, that does a layer. Of, well, he was running for U.S. Senate. Well, clearly, I mean, it, it's, it's very clear to me, having spent a lot of time thinking about this and researching it, that, that Robert Kennedy was evasive, if not dishonest, about what he really knew and what he really suspected about the possibility there was a conspiracy. You know, there's this amazing scene at his home in Virginia uh, in the hours after the assassination where he calls over the CIA director, um, a guy by the name of John McCone, takes him to the lawn of the Kennedy estate. What's the name? Hickory, Hickory Hill. Hickory Hill. And takes him on the lawn and says, did you kill my brother? Did the CIA kill the president? And McCone, who's a fellow Catholic, says, I swear that that did not happen. But Robert Kennedy, right from the get-go, believed that there might well have been a conspiracy involving even possibly the CIA to kill his brother. And we now know at the end of his life, we know from his friends and associates and his own family, that he continued to believe that until he died, even though he told the Warren Commission that he had no information, no suspicion of a conspiracy. There, I think there was one other reason why he didn't tell uh, the truth of the Warren Commission. He was ready for Senate. He was worried that uh, if the information came out about what the Kennedys, and they worked together on Absolutely. Operation Mongoose and all the crazy things they tried to do to, to get Castro, you know, tuberculosis and the wetsuit and and botulism pills, and, and a pen that was poison, and it's just a crazy cigar. thing. It was exploding yeah. cigars. I think he was afraid that that was going to come out, both because they'd failed and also because it was, it was seamy. You know, it, this was unseemly. And so I don't think he wanted the public to know. When he was in originally a tough battle with an incumbent Senator uh, Frank Keating, in, not Frank Keating, uh, Ke well, Senator Keating, forgotten his first name, uh, from uh, Kenneth Keating, Kenneth Keating, the Republican senator from New York that Bobby Kennedy defeated in November of 64. I think that's absolutely And Robert Kennedy, this Operation Mongoose, this assassination effort by the Kennedy assassination, Robert Kennedy was in charge of it. Oh, that absolutely. was his. That was, and he knew that if that got exposed, that if he had been involved in the assassination of foreign leaders, and it wasn't just Castro, there were others, uh, that that would, that would ruin his political career. Right. So apparently he was willing not to tell the truth about his brother's murder as a result. 
It is unsettling that those we entrust with national leadership might, A, believe in these conspiracies and then conspire to conceal them. Um, um, what do we know about Jack Ruby? I mean, a lot of people look at this thing and say, this wasn't an assassination. It was two assassinations in a weekend. Too fishy. One of the documents we just uh, found and, and released was, uh, was a little document. It was a tip given to the FBI in, I believe, 1977, okay, this is 14 years after the assassination, from a man in Dallas uh, who claimed to be an FBI informant, apparently had been paid by the FBI, at least for some things, who said that on the morning of the assassination, as the crowds were gathering, he was with Jack Ruby, very near Dealey Plaza, and that Jack Ruby said, come on, I want you to come with me down here. Let's watch the fireworks, quote, unquote. And then he claimed that, that uh, after the assassination, Ruby had no reaction, no reaction to the murder of a president, and then went to the Dallas Morning News where we knew he, he was. Pierce and, and uh, Hugh, they were, they were here. They were part of it, and they know exactly where Jack Ruby was, and Jack Ruby was, was not in Dealey Plaza or any place near it. Hugh Ainsworth, I, this, this, is a, this is a slight digression, but it's a worthwhile one. Um, was working for the Dallas Morning News that day, but was not assigned to, he had the day off. He goes to Dealey Plaza to see the president, right? Horrific events happens, he pulls a utility bill out of his pocket and starts interviewing the witnesses. He ends up in the Texas theater when Oswald was captured, right, Hugh? And, and then at the police station when Oswald is shot, and then in the weeks afterwards was just, I think, alone and apart among journalists getting real, solid, reliable information. And gosh, does he have stories. And his book, uh, which is Witness to History, uh, will also be available um, in the bookshop afterward, along with these two guys. So but thank Pierce, you. Pierce actually ran into Lee Harvey Oswald coming out of the school book depository. Lee Harvey Oswald pointed him to a telephone. Uh, I mean, Har Harvey Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald seemed awfully calm for all of this. Can I just mention that Dr. Philip Williams was in here and he asked one question. He was uh, at Parkland right outside trauma room one. He was assigned to take care of Mrs. Kennedy. And he told me some interesting things that she was not in shock. She was in complete control uh, the entire time and was concerned only about the priest getting inside to give extreme unction to President Kennedy. Mm. Um, so Jack Ruby, uh, are there other things about his movements that day that either support or discredit the notion that he was part of a conspiracy to shut up Oswald because Oswald was the patsy? Well, I, I think you. I think the more you know about Jack Ruby, the more the more difficult it is to, it is to believe he's part of anybody's conspiracy. <laughs> he is a delusional blabbermouth. I remember, I think Hugh actually tells me, Hugh's a very important part of my book, and he really is the great reporter on this story, um, that it, when Oswald is killed, and it's, Hugh believes if there's one person in Dallas who would do something this crazy, it was Jack Ruby, that he was the guy, he was the guy who would have been responsible for this. And I think all the evidence we have suggests that Oswald really was, he loved President Kennedy, he was shattered by the assassination, he really did this act as, a, as an act of revenge, he did it to, to protect Jacqueline Kennedy from having to return to Dallas to testify in Oswald's trial. And again, if there's one man you would not pick to be part of a conspiracy to carry out you know, the second crime of the century by killing Oswald, it's Jack Ruby. Well, they've obviously got you fooled. <laughs> you know, I have thought Phil was part of the conspiracy for a long time, and I, he's, he's confirmed that today. That's incredibly obvious, isn't it? Okay. Um, um, this is sort of a, a detail, but it's an interesting part of the story. How did Oswald get from this, from the school book depository building, um, to the Texas theater? Um, it's amazing that it all happened within feet of where we are, but um, Oswald goes to the street, he gets in a bus, city bus. He knew the city bus, bus system well. Uh, that's where he gets the bus transfer. Uh, but of course, the traffic is horribly congested as a result of what had just happened in Dealey Plaza. So he gets out of the bus, 
uh, gets into a cab and is driven to his rooming house in Oak Cliff. And from there, he changes his jacket of the rooming house, gets his pistol, his Smith & Wesson pistol, and begins walking, walking away, walking towards this Texas theater. And during the course of that walk, of course, he kills Officer Tippett. Um, and, you know, people would argue that, that there's certainly theories out there that, that Oswald was not the assassin of the president. But you do have to wonder why this man would kill an innocent police officer and be witnessed by so many people doing that. Except that one of these documents we just unearthed, an informant to the FBI uh, calls and says, uh, no, in fact, Oswald was not the one who killed Tippett. I saw it, it was Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby killed Officer Tippett. You know, th this is, you can understand why everybody was confused. But, but I, do th I do think though that the, the, the Tippett killing really is the Rosetta Stone of all this because many witnesses are very close to that and see it happen. Why would Lee Harvey Oswald kill Officer Tippett unless he had something larger to escape from? Here's one that says, have you seen the movie Coup in Camelot that uh, reevaluates the Zapruder film with current forensic analysis? No, they don't let me out very much. So <laughs> okay. I, I don't get to go to movies. All right. I, I haven't seen it. I'd like to, but I have okay. not seen it. Here's another one about another, another piece of media. Um, what are your thoughts on tracking Oswald on the History Channel? And do you think there's reason to believe that the Cuban government has silenced Sylvia Durant? Are you familiar with that? I'm yeah, else. That, that's uh, Bob, Bob Bear. I saw a couple theory. of episodes. It was bizarrely stopped. They began running, the, the History Channel, this is several months ago, began running this documentary series about, about the assassination. And then after a couple of episodes aired, they stopped running it without and explanation. And then they did it in the middle of the night. I actually, I, I have insomnia. I actually watched the whole series in the middle of the night. It's the only time I ever saw it, the whole thing here. There are like four or five episodes. Uh, well, you don't get out, but you do stay. I don't, you know, I'm, in, I'm inside. That's why I don't get out. I'm sleeping during the day because I can't sleep at night. But it was interesting. I thought he did a good job on, on the KGB and, the, and Kostikov, the Russian KGB agent, supposedly head of Department 13, the Assassinations Bureau, who interviewed uh, Oswald in Mexico City in the Russian... Embassy. See why we're so interested in Mexico City? Uh, he did a good job of that, and he concluded that the, the Russians just had no motive, and it was incredibly stupid, which is what the CIA concluded eventually in their reevaluation in the 70s about Cuba. It just made no sense that they would do it. His, his view was that, that there was a home, and it's true, there was a safe house for anti-Castro Cubans. And you say, well, Oswald wouldn't have been associated with them, except... He was, and Oswald didn't, Oswald was a Marxist-Leninist and couldn't tell you what that was. He was a very mixed up person in many respects. So uh, the, the theory is that Oswald was not walking aimlessly, and he wasn't necessarily going to Mexico, he was going to that safe house. Mm -hmm. And Bob Baer, the uh, producer of this series, insists that the safe house, uh, that everyone from the safe house disappeared the day after the assassination. They never came back. They took everything with them. I don't know. That's what he said. That's in the History Channel series. The History Channel, I don't, they didn't kill it because I saw it, but they certainly didn't promote it in the way that you would think they would promote something like that. Never ending story. Um, someone asked about the performance of the Secret Service uh, on the day of the assassination, and there's this issue of. Um, Witnesses who thought there, there might have been gunshots from the grassy knoll uh, reported finding people there who identified themselves as Secret Service agents and carrying weapons. I believe the Secret Service says it had nobody there. There was what nobody we, in Dealey Plaza. What do we make of that? Well, look, it, it's one of the unresolved questions that I have about this because there's no easy answer to it. Because you do have responsible citizens who I don't think imagine this. Uh, running up the grassy knoll and uh, someone identifying himself as a Secret Service agent with a weapon uh, told them they were to leave uh, and that he was Secret Service and the rest of it. And the Secret Service for the Warren Commission identified exactly where each Secret Service uh, part of the detail was at every minute. And none of them were in Dealey Plaza except on the cars as they went through. I think a, a I met a Secret Service, former Secret Service agent last night at another event, and he told me that they only had 
they had six agents uh, assigned to the assigned to the car, and that was that was about it. They had others doing advance work, and some were out at the trademark and so on. But there were only six with Kennedy. I thought that was a low number, but it's possible. So I don't know. That is that is a question I raise in the book. I can't answer some of these questions. Why weren't these questions answered? during the Warren Commission or shortly thereafter. The Warren Commission didn't interview a lot of these witnesses, right? They didn't interview a lot of the witnesses. They really didn't. And over the times, their stories have evolved a bit, some of them. Well, some of them, and also as, as uh, the wonderful policeman who was next to Oswald pulling him, pulling him and, and trying to save him, but actually positioned him well for the bullet, he told me that over, over many, many years, he had come to believe that if everyone who said they were in Dealey Plaza <laughs> could gather in one place, they would fill the Rose Bowl. You know how people make things. It's like Woodstock for my generation. There, there were 50 million people at Woodstock, except there weren't. Um, someone asks, what about LBJ? Could he have been involved? And, and we will note that um, Roger Stone, the <laughs> renegade political consultant and supporter of Donald Trump, wrote a book recently, which I have not read. The reviews said it Throws a lot of stuff out, but a lot, not a lot of evidence. What about the idea? I think it, I think it sold a heck of a lot better than our books did. <laughs> well, I think they're phony numbers. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> okay, but let's just indulge this for a second, right? I mean, um, we don't want to believe that, like, people who are elected to national offices would do such a thing. And yet you've got Robert Kennedy asking the director of the CIA, did, you, did your organization kill my brother? Maybe it's not so crazy. Is it crazy? I don't know. What, what, well, what it's not, it's not crazy. There's a logic to it. There's a logic to it. I don't think he did it. A logic of it. motive? Or, he, or he was, look, he was delighted to become president. That was his lifelong goal, and there he was. And he used to joke about the possibility that Kennedy would be assassinated and he would take his place. So He knew about the 20-year cycle. You know, every 20, the president elected every 20 years, sooner or later passed on and was succeeded by the vice president. I'm convinced it's one of the reasons why he accepted the vice presidency gave up Senate majority leadership, which had much more power than vice president. But that's it's a giant leap from there to say that he participated in or even knew about the assassination, in part because it was in Texas. It would automatically, some people assumed that he was involved because it happened in, in his state. I, I just don't believe it. Again, show me the evidence. Where is the evidence? It's just conjecture. I see, but there was a logic to it, and in fact, Arlen Specter, and I think I was one of the last people to interview him before he passed on, but Arlen Specter, who was this hard-charging young investigator on the Warren Commission, uh, said that he, he's, he's asked at the beginning of the investigation to prepare a list of witnesses who should be interviewed early on, and he said the first witness we need to interview is Mrs. Kennedy, and the second person we need to interview is President Johnson because he is a logical suspect in this murder. If it were any other situation, any other murder, he's the first person we'd want to the talk one to. The who benefits, right. right. But there's no evidence that he had any connection we're, to anything. Right? We're saying, well, you know, you've got lots of stuff on YouTube and the Internet generally about, you know, Johnson telling his mistress uh, the night before what he had done, except he wasn't where the mistress said he was. And uh, Look, you know, after a while, you realize that most of the things people say have no foundation, uh, no basis in fact. Uh, be and that has to be true because there are, you know, a hundred different somewhat, somewhat credible, logical explanations for the death of President Kennedy. Who did it? You know, who was involved? Who came from abroad, you know, the, the day of the jackal, all these assassination films, people see them and then they apply it to the Kennedy assassination. But they can't all be true. And you remember the, you know, the Onion, the um, satirical newspaper, which I, I enjoy thoroughly, they, they produced a paper once, which they, they sold, I've got a copy of it, and the headline is, you know, November 22nd, 1963, and the headline is, 146 people from the Mafia, Cubans, Russians, uh, and Lyndon Johnson uh, shoot 453 bullets at John F. Kennedy in Dealey Plaza. Uh, and, and, you know, if you, if you really read all this stuff, that's the conclusion you'd come to, except it can't be true. It isn't true. Okay, we're going to keep throwing these at you here. Um, what about the deathbed confessions of the Mafia, mafiosi? I mean, Carlos Marcello, who was the New Orleans mobster, and then Santo Traficante, the Florida guy, I think are alleged to have said, in prison late in life, do I have this right? That, yeah, 
we did it, we ordered the hit. Well, Howard Hunt had a deathbed confession, but I look, on that, I don't know the full truth of that, but deathbed confessions are overrated. <laughs> you know, sometimes people are, are looking for uh, immortality on their deathbed. So there is, a, there, there is some justification for a mobster One saying that. One case it was to a lawyer who was plugging a book. It's a much better book. If, yes, yeah, it's a much uh, better book if it's true and had the deathbed confession. You know, I guess what, what, what struck me about that was you, know, you have a Warren Commission that doesn't... At, at, pursue things like that as actively as they should have. And then you have when something like this happens, you know, people, journalists would want to know, would want to ask the follow-up questions. Really? You did this? How? Who did it? Who did you order? Who did you pay? How did it ha happen? And of course, if there were some empowered body, like the House Select Committee in operation at the time, you could put them under oath, right? Ask follow-up questions. But it just kind of hangs out there and leaves people wondering. True. I, you know, one thing that really has changed over the years is, I, I, you know, I think back in 1963 and 1964, there was the assumption that when senior government officials offered information or offered their own conclusions, they were telling the truth. There was the assumption they were telling the truth. What has happened in the 54 years since is we've had the Vietnam War, we've had Watergate, we've had Iran-Contra, we've had Bill Clinton's problems, we've had every reason to believe that our government is not telling this, the truth anymore. And I think when we have our next great national tragedy, there will be a much more aggressive investigation uh, because the assumption will be made that we are not being told the truth. And that's probably why we don't have these sorts of conspiracy theories, or at least not the, the number of them or the volume of them that you get out of 9-11 and the 9-11 Commission. Um, there's a woman named Sylvia Odio. You know, we were talking about this notion that Lee Harvey Oswald had talked about wanting to kill Kennedy in Mexico at the party that Sylvia Duran may have been at. There's a completely separate case involving another, another Sylvia, Sylvia Odio. That happened here in Dallas, I think, right? She still lives here, I believe. Um, tell us about that one. It's a slightly complicated, but the, the shorthand version is that uh, this young Cuban-American woman living in Dallas gets a knock on her door uh, in September 1963 from two Cuban mercenaries, anti-Castro mercenaries, traveling with a, a man, a, a young American, who says he's a former Marine with rifle training, who supports Castro's revolution, or I'm sorry, is opposed to Castro's revolution, and wants to see President Kennedy assassinated for not having overthrown Castro. Um, this is, again, weeks before the assassination. Uh, and she tells this story to the Warren Commission afterwards, and she says this man was Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, and it seems to be, from what the Warren con Commission can determine, a she seems to be very credible. And she's actually told other people back, and she also told people back in September about this encounter with this man. And so why was Lee Harvey Oswald, if Lee Harvey Oswald was the man, why was he traveling with these anti-Castro mercenaries talking openly about trying to kill President Kennedy. Uh, her story is dismissed by the Warren Commission, but years later, there's reason to believe that she was telling the truth. Years later, why? What's new? Because her story was initially dismissed because the FBI was desperate to prove that it wasn't true. They didn't really care what the facts were. They just wanted her story to be ignored and dismissed because it complicated their idea that Oswald was the lone assassin, that there was nobody else he was working with. And this leads to all sorts of theories about whether or not anti-Castro exiles were somehow involved in this conspiracy, that they wanted Kennedy dead uh, because they blamed him for n not having overthrown Castro. Right, and anti-Castro exiles often worked with mafiosi. Um, so. And again, Oswald could have associated with them because they had the same goal, killing President Kennedy, even if they were on opposite sides of Castro. Of course, the that's the theory. The fascinating thing about these <clears throat> tantalizing descriptions of Oswald having spoken about wanting to kill President Kennedy is that this happened weeks before the assassination when he would have had no idea that Kennedy was coming to Dallas, right? And his, it's an utter coincidence that he had a job at this building, right? Uh, it was a happenstance. 
It was not arranged by the CIA. Actually, he's hired by the Texas School Book Depository, which actually had two outlets in Dallas. There's one in Dealey Plaza, and I guess there was some one, there's another elsewhere in the city. And it's really happenstance that he got his job here. Um, one of the questions is, why was there no response to the question of whether or not Oswald worked for the CIA? And we should throw in the FBI, too, because there was a story that you Well, because to. they deny it. <laughs> Getting to our question about whether you can trust the government. Uh, again, look, who will ever know, other than the people who were running the CIA at that time, they claimed that they had done a very thorough job of checking out whether they had ever used Oswald as a source for anything, uh, whether he was a double agent during the time he was, he was in the Soviet Union. And, uh, they insist that there is no connection whatsoever. And again, you mentioned about Ruby. Who, who in the heck would use Ruby? as, a, as a, an agent of anything, or, or as given the responsibility of killing an assassin. Well, you could say the same thing about Oswald. Uh, this was a very disturbed human being. This is not, all these things have not been invented about him. He was a, a very disturbed person. Uh, he, there, there are so many conspiracy theories that involve the idea that Oswald was on the, that he was working for the agency or he was working for the FBI. But I would ask you to remember, if he was working on the, as an employee of either of those agencies, or an informant or whatever, would they have him living in the situation of dire poverty in, in Dallas? He was undernourished. Under, he, he, apparently his, his, his kid was, just, uh, was, was, was barely coherent because he wasn't getting enough nutrition. Would, he, would they allow him to beat his wife to the point where Marina's walking the streets with a black eye and purplish bruises? Um, and, you know, he was a delusional misfit. Why would they really have put this guy in their employ? Would they really have involved him in a conspiracy to kill the president of the United States? Um, how much responsibility does the FBI have for failing to identify Oswald as a danger to the Secret Service? I mean, it's clear they had looked at him. Well, basically, There's and, and again, the, the new documents reinforce the fact, which is very regrettable, and was repeated prior to 9-11. The CIA wasn't talking to the FBI. The FBI wasn't talking to the CIA, and neither was talking to the Secret Service, was telling the Secret Service anything. They didn't even know Lee Harvey Oswald existed. Uh, in fact, in these documents, you'll find the CIA takes pot shots at the FBI, and the FBI takes pot shots at the CIA, and they openly talk about, within their own group, withholding information from the other ones. Because knowledge is power, and they had the power. They had certain knowledge. They didn't want to share it with, with other agencies. Which we the saw play out in the 9-11. 9-11, the yeah. very um, same thing happened prior to 9-11. I think it's, it's bureaucratic human nature, unfortunately. It's, fasc it's fascinating, Phil, that in your book, you note that uh, J. Edgar Hoover, in fact, disciplined uh, FBI agents in the Dallas office, right? And Well, this was... Clear-cut perjury by J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover goes to the Warren Commission. He's, he, he's required to give sworn testimony, and he says that the FBI made no mistakes. We had no reason to believe this man, Lee Harvey Oswald, was a threat. There was no need for us to report any of this to the Secret Service before Kennedy came to Dallas. We did nothing wrong here. Well, it turns out, as he's saying this to the Warren Commission under oath, He's at the same time disciplining 17 agents within the FBI for having made terrible mistakes and having failed to act on evidence about Oswald, including the fact that Oswald had this trip to Mexico City where he may have talked openly about killing the president. Hmm. There's this FBI agent, James Hosty, right, who was in the Dallas Bureau and actually tore up a note that Oswald had written to the FBI. Well, he was ordered to do it. He was Let's ordered to do give it. Him right. credit for the that. Sunday after the assassination, and we were talking before this, this event with Hugh Ainsworth, who we were talking about James Hosty, the FBI agent, and Phil, you and Hugh agreed that you found him a sympathetic character. Well, I did, in Why? a sense, he, he was the guy who was assigned surveillance of Oswald in the weeks before the assassination. And he actually did that surveillance pretty aggressively. He did what he was asked to do. And in fact, he reopens an investigation of Oswald after another agent had, had closed it. Um, and it's very clear that a lot of information was withheld from Hosty that the bureaucracy of the FBI 
had not made it possible for Hosty to know the extent of the, of the threat that Oswald posed. For example, all this information about Oswald's trip to Mexico City, the fact that he's meeting in Mexico City with a KGB agent who happens to be an assassinations expert, that wasn't passed on to Hosty in Dallas. You have to believe that if Hosty had that information on November 21st, he would have known that Oswald was a threat, would have rounded him up, and, and the world would be a different place. Guy had eight children, and it really derailed his career, didn't it? Yeah. But then, you know, he, he, he is the guy, he is on the, on the, so President Kennedy's killed on Friday, Oswald's killed on Sunday morning. Uh, that afternoon, um, Hosty is ordered to take this note, a handwritten note that Oswald had presented to the FBI office just a couple weeks before, uh, apparently threatening. Uh, the host, he takes it to a men's room, shreds it, and flushes it down a toilet. Um, and you have to wonder what was in there. What else did Oswald try to communicate to the FBI just a few weeks before the assassination? Well, so the Sunday after the assassination, he tears up Oswald's note, flushes it down the toilet, and why do we know that today? Well, he admitted it. I'm trying yeah. to think how it... We know it actually because of Hugh Ainsworth. Hugh Ainsworth you. learns that, again, you know, he is the <laughs> ultimate reporter on this story that uh, Hugh writes a story in 1977. Um, the Dallas Times-Herald, um, Hugh had defected to the Di Dallas Times-Herald from the morning news. They, the, they, they discovered that this, that this note had been destroyed, had been destroyed by Hosty, and it creates a enormous firestorm in 1977. You know, further proof of how somebody was trying to cover up something about the Kennedy assassination. And from what we know of the note, it he was complaining about being harassed by the FBI. That not, doesn't necessarily tell us much about a conspiracy, but tearing it up is going to invite speculation. It sure does tell us that he felt he was being harassed by the FBI. And I believe Hugh, is, am I right that there were, he, there were people who thought there was a bomb threat? He said he was going to, he, he was gonna, there was going to be a violent act against the FBI. Further proof that Oswald was a violent threat to somebody. Um, we began when I asked you how you got interested in this subject. I mean, Larry, you said it. your interest was really in the Kennedy presidency, and it goes back to your childhood and a real connection. And, you know, this was a president who was young and rich and charismatic and then cut off in the prime in this violent and mysterious way. And I'm, it's unfair to ask you to do this in two minutes, but... Your book is called The Kennedy Half Century. How has his presidency and the assassination affected politics in the decade since? Well, I'm sure most of you have watched the, the wonderful uh, PBS series, Ken Burns uh, and his associate, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment. Uh, Lynn. Yes, Lynn, exactly, Novick or whatever. Novick. They're, they're a wonderful series on Vietnam. Well, you can start just with Vietnam. Now, can anybody ever prove that Kennedy would have either withdrawn from Vietnam or kept troops at a much lower level? No, you cannot prove it because politicians say one thing and do another. But I spent a lot of time on that for my own book because it was important to me and to, to millions of others my age how Vietnam happened, how this disaster happened. And I am personally convinced, having looked at all the documents and talked to as many people that were still living from that era uh, who were involved, that Kennedy uh, would not have uh, accelerated Vietnam, certainly in the way that Lyndon Johnson did, and wouldn't have gotten anywhere near the 530,000 troops uh, at the peak for Lyndon Johnson. So right there, if you didn't have Vietnam, imagine uh, how things would have been different, but not just in elections, but in terms of the American psyche. But I spent a third of my book actually uh, going through the presidents since uh, since uh, John F. Kennedy, each one of them, and showing how they used Kennedy's legacy to achieve their own. The obvious case, Lyndon Johnson, but it goes all the way through the presidents right up to Obama. That's when my book came out in 2013. Uh, so all the presidents were covered, and every one of them, Reagan in particular, used John F. Kennedy on foreign policy and tax cuts, uh, and also cultivated the Kennedy family, had them into the Oval Office constantly. Didn't make the mistake that Jimmy Carter had made. Jimmy Carter alienated the Kennedys right from the get-go. Uh, so he had, he had a tremendous effect. He still does. He always will because the Kennedys translate to the 21st century, and maybe for all we know the 22nd, in a way that other presidents don't. 
They're dusty historical figures, and maybe because they're so young, and Kennedy was cut down in his prime, uh, and they were so fashionable, and they were so articulate, that they'll always be used, and people will always relate to them in some fashion or another. And that's what I think we ought to remember about President Kennedy, certainly his achievements, but also uh, who he was in life and what he did as president, not just the moment of his death, obviously had nothing to do with it. it was, those were other people acting, or one person acting, whatever, whatever you want to believe. Before we wrap up, uh, Bill, you want to share a final thought? Or? Um, I'm, sometimes, I'm, 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 I'm often asked whether or not we'll ever have any final resolution, whether these documents that we're supposedly going to see uh, between now and, and April will really resolve a lot of questions about the assassination. And unhappily, I'm absolutely convinced that is not the case, that we are going to be with conspiracy theories about the Kennedy assassination forever, because we now know so much basic evidence disappeared or was destroyed just within days of the assassination. We're still arguing about the Lincoln assassination. I mean, people come up with new theories all the time. Go 150 years into the future. Do you seriously think we won't have new TV programs and new books on the, uh, on the Kennedy assassination? Even though uh, two books have already resolved anything that was important. <laughs> you know, but there will be more who will be pretenders, and it will happen for centuries. Okay. Um, I want to remind everyone that Phil's book, uh, A Cruel and Shocking Act, and Larry's book, uh, The Kennedy Half Century, and Hugh Ainsworth's book, Witness to History, uh, signed copies will be available downstairs at the bookstore. I truly recommend them. Uh, join me in thanking these guys. Um, Thank you.